Please open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 31. Speaking, and he says to Moses, See, I have chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with wisdom, with understanding, with knowledge, with all kinds of skills, to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut and set stones, to work in wood, and to engage in all kinds of crafts. Moreover, I have appointed Aholiab, son of Ahamak, of the tribe of Dan, to help him. Also, I have given ability to all the skilled workers to make everything I have commanded you. And these are the instructions for the completion of the tabernacle back in the Old Testament time. Well, this is Labor Day. You would think that Labor Day would be celebrated by working, but instead it seems to be one of the primo vacation days of the season. And two deacons have taken this to heart. They've gone on vacation, so we don't have a full complement of deacons up here, but we do have deaconesses that are gonna step in so that communion will be done. And I can see why people wanna get away because we work a lot. As a matter of fact, uh, if you look around the world, Germans work 1,371 hours a year. That sounds impressive. It's also at the bottom. Americans work 1,789 hours, which is 30% more. We even work more than the Canadians. Guess who puts in the most hours? South Korea is very, very high, but they're not number one. Number one, Mexicans, 2,228 hours. That's a quarter more than us. And some say it's because their labor laws are so lax that employers can get away with anything. All of us, whatever country you're in, we, we work. But work has changed over the years. America used to be known for its extensive factories. When you turn an object over, it said, made in the USA. How often have you seen that lately, right? Made in China. Wharton, just north of Dover, used to have a decent sized steel foundry with two blast furnaces. Roxbury was known for Hercules gunpowder. We had a sizable explosion every couple years. <laughs> we also employed hundreds and hundreds of local men and women. And now it's this big empty spot. They keep talking about what they're gonna do with it, but nothing ever gets done. These places are no more. And part of the problem is we're working so much smarter these days. In 1940, there were 530,000 coal miners. That's more than half a million. Today, there's only 80,000. But those 80,000 produced twice as much coal as in 1940. Steel production. We're about the same as 1940. It actually peaked around 1970, but we'd give as much steel as in 1940, and yet it requires only a fifth as many workers. What will the future bring? I understand that one of the biggest employers in America is trucking. Three million men and women, mostly men, earn their living by trucking. But just this year, you've already seen the articles about self-driving taxis that are now testing around the place, but the big change is self-driving trucks. They're developing these fleets already. Millions of people are going to be out of work. And that is a concern for people. But even when we put big factories in, you go to any modern factory, you'll see more robots than you will human beings. And that's a concern. Will there be anything left for us? But I think the good answer is, instead of doing boring, repetitive stuff, we'll let machines do that. We can do the creative things, the smart things. And with this new world that we live in, what exactly are you going to create? I believe that work is a good thing. It's something we're celebrating, and not just by taking off and doing nothing. I think work in itself is very valuable because God is the biggest worker of them all. He's the one that's created everything around us. We look at our children, we might appreciate God, you know, what a wonderful creation, but really everything around us. 
And there's one American who has a special appreciation for this. His name is Jeff Williams, and he is an astronaut. And he is right now on the International Space Station, and he's going to be up there for 172 days this time. But he's been up there multiple times. As a matter of fact, when he returns, he will have spent 534 days in space, which is more than any American ever. He is also a very committed Christian. And just recently, he had an interview with a, uh, a Baptist seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. And he shared with them, they, I guess they had this video uplink, they could see him floating around up there. And he says one of his favorite things is to take high resolution photographs of the earth and looking down. And that would be an amazing sight to be up there just cruising over the earth once every hour and a half. And he says, when I look out the window and I see all the elements, they're what you would imagine you would see with a creative work by an infinite God. He says, you see the design, you see the beauty, you see the purpose, you see all those elements, you see order in all the details. But there's one thing he does that especially magnifies it for him when he does a spacewalk. He says, you're out there and it's really something else to be outside. You're inside a suit that is sustaining your life and you can see through that full face visor, not only the vastness and the majesty of the globe itself, but deep out in the space, it just deepens a comprehension, the observation of what we know through scripture about the amazing creative work of God. It's an incredibly humbling experience. And so he certainly has a perspective I would love to have. I would love to go into space. I'm sure my wife would love to send me there, you know, one way. <laughs> but just to see it all in one glance, that, and you probably realize how small the earth is and how tiny it looks compared to the, the coldness and the darkness that's out there. But yet, God has made probably even more amazing things than Earth. We haven't even been there yet. We can only dream about it. But when we create things, we're acting like God. And I think that's why we do create, because we are made in the image of God. Humans have created not just spacecraft, you know, cars and boats and art and literature, cities that gleam. Now, animals can create some things. I mean, you probably have some bird nests in your backyard. And beavers create their dams, and they're pretty good at that. But we're the only ones that can really mold a planet. And just this summer, geologists got together, and they decided that we have entered a new geologic ep epoch. And in the past, it's usually been these extinction events, like in the dinosaurs die out. They say, now we're in a, a new geologic age. Well, they say that humans are having such an impact on the Earth, they decided that right now we're living in the Anthropocene age. And this is an age that things are being molded by us more than they're being molded by nature. And they've decided to come up with a marker that shows the barrier between our age and the, and the previous geologic age. And that marker is radioactive fallout from those atomic bombs we tested back in the 40s and 50s. They said that's something that's very unique and that, that future geologists will always be able to trace it back to this. So we obviously can have an impact for good and for bad. And it kind of reflects just the whole nature of work itself. You know, many people think of, well, doesn't the Bible say that work is a curse? the toil and the sweat of your brow. It does say that in the book of Genesis, after Adam and Eve disobeyed, work became toil. But it doesn't mean work itself is a bad thing because they were given work even before they disobeyed. It says in Genesis chapter two, verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And so that's when he was in the full blessing of God. So I think work is one of the most important things you can do, to be creative, to produce something. And I think that every one of us ought to be creating something that adds value to this world. And every one of us can create something good. The passage I read to you uh, from Exodus, uh, it's talking about the preparation for building the beautiful, movable t uh, sanctuary that they had. They called it the tabernacle. And even though it was like a tent, they had to use real high quality stuff, you know, silver and gold and precious stones. And there had to be a few people that knew how to do this. And it amazes me, they've recently found some, uh, I think in Turkey, some ancient graves that are like 6,000 years old. And yet these graves, the people are buried with beautiful jewelry that's been very finely worked. People, ever since they've learned how to do metal, they have done an incredible job at it. 
And so we have this ability, and I think it comes from God. I think every single person has a creative ability given to them. Some have certain gifts, some have others, some have lots of gifts, some have pretty little, but you have something that you need to develop, something that you can do that makes a difference. What is it gonna be? Well, I think that first of all, you've got to develop what you've got. And I think that every single person here ought to be constantly growing, educating yourself. That might mean going to college. Uh, my wife, uh, she finished college, she's like 50 years old because she uh, had gone to a, a degree program when she was a, a young nurse and did that for many years. And then she got a position, they said, oh, you really need more education. She said, okay, I'll go through with whatever you know, I've got to do. She did it online. But so many times she'd come to me and say, it's a lot of work, but I'm learning something. I never knew this. She really got into it. I think that's exciting that you can keep on learning throughout life. Even if you're not in a formal school, you can go to the library and get some books. You can buy them on Amazon for like a penny a piece and then $4 for shipping for just about any book in the world. You can go on the internet and get stuff for free. There's so much that you can gain and to dig deeper really makes you a more full human being. You know, I uh, found out about the Wharton um, um, blast furnace only because I used to visit Bill Trengove and in his basement, he recreated the Wharton of his youth, including that blast furnace. And I didn't realize how impressive that was until I did research for this sermon and I wanted to look at pictures of this blast furnace. And all the pictures underneath, there's a note by the guy that put it there that says, this is inspired by Bill Trengove. And he was doing all this research into what was you know, in Wharton, and now we've come across these photos. And he says, even though he's gone now, you know, he has inspired us. And I think all of us should have that ability to dig deeper and to build something unique. Nadine Montgomery creates beautiful quilts. Doris Shrum does needlework. Some of you have created beautiful gardens. If you go to see Ed Byron, you'll notice two things about his house. One is that he's got more firewood than anybody in the state of New Jersey. <laughs> and it's beautifully housed. I mean, it's, just, it's perfect there. But then you go in his backyard, and he says, well, you know, originally it was like a 15-foot drop from my house down, and then there was just these woods. But he has filled up against the house and dug out this pond it is the most beautifully landscaped thing you've ever seen, including one of those Monet uh, Japanese bridges that goes across, even though he's got to add water to his uh, pond because it just naturally sucks away. But it's a beautiful thing that he has created. Some of you have built your own homes or added on your homes. You've done something that's going to last. And I think that all of us need to realize that there's things that can be created the things that are worthwhile, and not all of them are objects. When we think of creating something, we think of like, you know, making a house or a garden, but much of what we create is ideas. Think of some of the biggest companies in the world right now. Google, Microsoft, what concrete thing do they produce? What they're dealing with is knowledge and ideas. Even think of the Bible itself. This is a lot of paper, it's got leather and you know, a little bit of, a, I guess, like a silver imprint on it. That's an object, but the essence of it is an idea. The, you know, the teaching about God and much of what humans do that really is important is not something tangible, but it's intangible. And that's why I think one of the most important achievements we can have is when we invest in other people. And this week, school's gonna start opening again and you know, little kids are gonna go and when I was young, this was one of the worst weeks of my life. I would have a knot in my stomach, and it began when my mom would take me to J.C. Penney's and say, now you're getting a new outfit. We go, ah, oh, no, summer can't be over. You know, I, and then they beat you at school, and we just hated school. And then you get to school, and you find out it's not that bad. As a matter of fact, they say one of the most important things that can happen to a child is encountering a good teacher. Not an average teacher, a really good teacher. For me, it was Mrs. Baker in the third grade. I was her little pet, and she let everyone know that. But she made me want to study and learn and really strive to, you know, to grab all this knowledge. They say that one bad teacher can ruin a kid, but one good one can change them for life. And even if you're not a teacher, we all can have that kind of impact on others. So there's some areas I want you to look at 
about applying yourself in life, and one would be at work. Now, many of us, when we think of our creativeness, I mean, we go when we have a job or a profession, we go out and we do something. And I think that every Christian, when they go to work, they ought to do a good job. Even if they treat you crummy, you do a good job because you are you. And you might think, well, they're not paying me enough. They take advantage of me. But nevertheless, in the New Testament, a lot of these people were working for slave masters because they were slaves. And the advice of the Bible is do a good job, not just when they're watching you, because God's always watching you. So you are working for him. And we sometimes need to have that same attitude. We also need to work creatively, come up with new ideas. I know uh, a small Christian company in the area, they make uh, cooling towers and they make them out of plastic. Most people make them out of steel, they make theirs out of plastic. And if you know anything about cooling towers, they take you know, heat out of like air or water and they transform it and, you know, by usually dropping water down and pushing air through. And so it takes the heat out of a system. And inside a cooling tower, there's some things that really love it, like bacteria. And they grow and it can spread through an entire building and that's where you get Legionnaire's disease. And after I gave this illustration at the early service, Mark Noyes came up to me and said, I can't tell you the times I was in a cooling tower and this slime is all over the wall and you know, it's just a terrible thing. And they try to treat the water because people can die from this disease. Well, this little company that's over uh, in uh, Mount Olive, one of their guys was watching TV and he says that they have these new cutting boards you can use in the kitchen, the plastic board, but they have an antimicrobial element built right into the plastic. And he looked at that and he says, well, if that works in a kitchen, maybe that'll work in a cooling tower. This week, they're coming out with a new product that this antimicrobial element is fused into the plastic. And they say it'll last like 30 years. And they're the only one in the market that has this special thing that hopefully will cut down on Legionnaires. They're not guaranteeing it'll cure it, but it's going to cut it down. And it's because someone got inspired, you know, watching a TV show. We can all come up with new ideas, and now don't just work for a paycheck. Work to create something that will last. You also have an important obligation at home. When you're raising those little kids, uh, you are creating memories for them. You're creating a life for them. And even if you're a grandparent, I'm realizing more and more, you know, you only have so much time with them, you wanna have a positive impact. And so we should do projects that bind the generations together. The Holwigs have a project. We have a red wool blanket, and we have hundreds of cloth patches. Every time we visit a national park, we buy one of those cloth patches. We have hundreds of them. How many have been sewed on the blanket? Zero. <laughs> but Celeste, when she says when she retires, she's going to start putting them all on there to show our grandkids, here's all the places we've been in life. Where have you been? and to kind of draw it out that the world is a big place for them. You know, this season is when kids go out apple picking, pumpkin picking, and make them appreciate the beauty of outside, that you can take a natural object like that and create good food out of it. Not just something that's, you know, shrink-wrapped at ShopRite, but that we can create it from what comes up from the earth because God has given it to us. You can make important lessons out of it, but you only have a limited amount of time. Last night, my brother called me on the phone. He likes to do that when I'm in the middle of my sermon time. And he told me that his youngest son, my young nephew, has left the house. He is at basic training in Fort Dix, Oklahoma. And he says, my nest is empty. My wife is driving me up the wall. She wants to get a condo down on the beach somewhere. You know, it's like he was the entertainment for them. And now he's gone. And you realize that they grow up so quickly and you can have a limited impact on them, but they're basically on their own. So while they're young, mold them. Create something good in them because you don't have much time. I think we also should think about our church. We have a beautiful sanctuary. This year, actually early next year, it's gonna be 100 years old. We're gonna have a special ceremony right after Easter in which we celebrate it. And if you look at it, I mean, the beautiful windows, and I like the intimate way it is. Modern churches are often big and kind of austere and cold. This one is a warm sanctuary. And the reason you have these big, austere churches is because it costs too much money to create this kind of stuff. 
It's done by hand. It's done with materials that doesn't, it's very difficult to get nowadays. Like the stained glass made in Newark. Those places are all gone. You could duplicate it, but it's hugely expensive. And so people don't. But you know, as much time and effort as they put in to make a beautiful sanctuary, that's not the most important thing that happens in a church. The Bible talks about the stones that build a church. Not the stones that some of you, like uh, uh, Pam friends, like uh, great-grandfather, I guess or Bob's grandfather, actually pick up stones to bring and build this church. But the Bible says the important stones in the church are the living stones. You, you people are the ones making up the church. And we need to get new people into the church, but we also need to get people transformed once they're in this church. Our purpose is not to fill pews. Our purpose is to fill people with the good news of Jesus Christ, that they might be saved. When's the last time you know of someone accepting Jesus as their savior? You know, we've kind of put that on the back burner. We're just hoping that people come and hear it and that somehow they'll absorb it by osmosis. You need to talk to them about it. And maybe you yourself, you're not sure what you believe. You ought to know what you believe because the Bible says you can know. God has revealed it to us. And after you've become saved, are you growing any? Maybe you've been going to this church 50, 60 years. You know, praise God. What have you learned this last year? What are you creating that is going to last? Uh, we have a challenge that it's an old message, but we can do it in fresh ways. You know, when we had our planning meeting, we did what we always do basically duplicated what we've done in previous years. We've dropped some of the picnics. We've added a few more things, little touches to it. But churches are traditional. We do things the way they've always been done. But our world is changing. You talk to some of your young people. Like I talk to my kids. And we had, you know, two weeks in Norway. We got to talk to each other in these houses. And I realized some of their attitudes are really different. Their ideas about politics. I'm thinking, where did you get that idea? It must be from your mother. It's not coming from me. Yeah. <laughs> And the world is changing. So we have to keep up with that to keep the gospel fresh. And we need to realize that what we're doing, it can last forever. This week, I have been on a, a little uh, project because a person came to me from the community and she's like a local history buff. She says, I've been doing a lot of research on my family. And I realized my family was in your church in the beginning. And I, it was fascinating because she herself is an agnostic Jew. She doesn't go to a Baptist church. She doesn't believe in Jesus. But she said, as I've done this research into my family, I realize that some of them were here from, at the beginning. As a matter of fact, some of her ancestors were founding members of this church before this church even stood. They were up the street in 1874. And here's what our members look like in 1874. Thomas Willits and Christiana Willits. It's on the back of your little handout there. These people believed in Jesus Christ so much that they gave their life savings and their time to build that little church up. A church that was so small they met in the basement for a year because they couldn't afford to finish the top of the church. And the whole church only cost them $5,000. But these are the people that labored away at it. And so I've been making all these scans and some of hers are what we call uh, uh, albumen, those are like the postcard pictures that are on cardboard. Some of them are tin types. Some of them are ambro types, which is like a polished metal, much older. And a few are daguerreotypes, daguerreotypes, 1850 or earlier. And you're looking at this image and you realize this is someone who lived 160 years ago. And it dawned on me as I was doing all these time consuming scans that every single one of these people is dead. Their children are dead. Their grandchildren are even dead. And for many of them, the only thing you're going to know about them, I mean, you look at this person, they could be sitting in our pew right now. Dress would be a little different. But, you know, what did they believe? Who were they? You don't know. We have an image, we have a name, maybe a couple dates, and that's it. They're gone. They're almost completely forgotten. And you will be too, unless you believe in Jesus. Because if you believe in Jesus, the Bible says, your work in the Lord is not in vain. It will last forever. If these people believed in Jesus, they live still. And that's why I think we ought to be extra creative as Christians. Because what we do will last for eternity. Are you a Christian? 
Let's bow our heads in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we look at the world and the stuff that humans have created, and it is amazing just being able to get in a huge chunk of metal that goes up into the air and flies across an ocean. Human ingenuity has created this. But you're the one who gives us that ingenuity. When we create, we're being just like you. So help us, Lord, to create things that are important, things that are worthwhile, things that will last. But in the end, only our faith in you lasts forever. So help us, Lord, to believe and to be committed to you. In Jesus' name, amen.